Welcome to a special edition of Backstory Today. I'm pleased to be your host, John Underwood, for consecutive interviews with candidates for the Los Alamitos Unified School District Board of Education election 2018. Well, it is my pleasure uh, as moderator for this uh, candidate studio interviews program to uh, begin with one of our candidates, Elena Anderson. Welcome to Backstory. And uh, Elena, you have some history uh, as a school teacher in several school districts in Southern California. You also have a child who is uh, in what grade? She's in third grade at McGill Elementary School. Okay, so you've got a long way to go with the district in terms of your own personal interests. And you've been involved in your child's uh, social life uh, as a scout mom. And, and maybe some people will know uh, Olena from uh, her interest in uh, controlling violence on campus and the organization that she is very committed to, which is Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America. And um, you've been very active with this organization. We've seen you out there uh, uh, on the campus and uh, holding a banner. Um, and obviously, this is an important issue to you. So uh, we'll try and unpack a little bit of that in a moment. But I, as I'm doing with all of the uh, candidates for board uh, in this process, I'm going to ask you, the first question out of the box, what makes you uniquely qualified to hold a school board position and to be elected by the people on November 6th for that position? Well, as you mentioned, I'll be the only person on the school board who has a child currently enrolled in the district, mm. which means that every single day I see what the parents need and what the teachers need and what condition the buildings are in, what classroom supplies we're being asked to purchase and donate to the school. Mm -hmm. And I hear from parents every day when I drop my daughter off and I pick her up about what they're seeing happening in the schools. And the other thing is I was a high school teacher at in school districts with a similar demographic, which means I understand how a school district works from the inside out. Um, and so then when I walk onto campus with my teacher's eye, because that never goes away, um, I see things and ways that the district could be better serving all of our students and supporting our teachers that other school board members who have no experience in education might not see. Mm -hmm. Additionally, I have been a vested interest in this community. Since we moved here, I was the president of the Moms Club International of Seal Beach Old Town. And that was for the preschool age, right when my daughter was less than a year old. And I've been, as you said, a founding member of Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America in Orange County. Our chapter started with just two or three moms, and we've grown into hundreds. And we are most... Were you one of those two or three moms? I was one of the two or three moms. <laughs> We'd sit at a coffee table in a coffee shop and hope that another fourth or fifth person would come. Yeah. And after the Parkland shooting, we had to rent out a space so more than 200 moms could come, and dads. Yeah, that was um, a, quite a seminal event, wasn't it? It was, it was. And you mentioned that I've been on campus with my signs and my representation for Moms Demand Action. And actually, I was there at the organization of a student, a high school senior, who was motivated, Zach Bratt, at, um, by Parkland to energize the students around him mm -hmm. to register voters and to make a statement that we don't have a place for guns on campuses. Yeah. So I was honored for him to invite me as well as to be on a, a panel with um, our congressmen, school law enforcement, and school teachers to talk about mental health mm -hmm. as well as physical safety for students. Okay. There, there certainly must be other issues uh, that face the Los Alamitos Unified School District uh, going forward in 2019. What do you anticipate those to be and how will you address those? Um, there are, of course, always lots of issues facing students and teachers. Um, one of the issues that our school district needs improvement in is the culture of the school district. 
As a high school teacher, I always had an escape plan and a lesson plan, um, but I also always knew that te while test scores and trophies tend to be the beacon of success that voters will look at because it's fast and easy, there's a number, and that administrators are very proud of, a school is more than test scores and trophies. It's a culture, and the culture of our elementary school and high school and middle schools needs improvement, and the culture is set from the top. The school board members hire the teachers, I mean, hire the superintendent, who then hires the assistant principals and principals and teachers. They also choose what the curriculum will be. The teachers have influence on that, but the school board has the final approval of, of what the curriculum is, what books will be used in the classrooms and library, and what the teacher development and student um, programs like character counts will be used on the school mm -hmm. campuses. As a parent, I see what those, um, those choices are and how they affect the schools immediately. Right now, there needs to be a clearer communication from the teachers up to the school board so that the teachers can have a voice, but there's a hierarchical sense of communication where teachers are restricted in their ability to communicate with the board and their input isn't valued at the school board level. They don't feel they have a voice at the table. Do you feel that's by design? I am endorsed by the Los Alamitos Education Association. So the teachers have had eight and 12 years to build a relationship with the incumbents and chose not to endorse the incumbents. They chose to endorse me, mm -hmm. a parent and a teacher, because I made it clear that that sort of communication line will be very important to me. Right now, the teachers do feel that they are not welcome to jump from classroom to district administration to voice their opinions. And they've actually said the words they're worried about um, retribution if they do make those sorts of any kinds of complaints. Is it frowned upon or even restricted uh, protocol for teachers to approach a board member even and, 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 talk and discuss issues directly, informally or formally? The school board should be readily accessible to the teachers and the parents and the other um, administrators on the sites. There have been in the past and in other districts school board members who go to the schools as I intend to at lunchtime and sit in the teachers lounges and hear from the teachers directly and have that open sense of communication. Right now the teachers are experiencing school board members coming to like the first day of school, peeking in the classroom, seeing that everything looks beautiful, it's the first day of school so naturally, and then going away with no communication and the teachers, and I know having been a teacher, feeling pressured or like they don't know what to say to somebody who doesn't speak at all to them. Mm -hmm. That's not an appropriate school district ex experience. But could a teacher, even informally, let's say at a, at after a, a board meeting or by email, um, address a board member directly uh, with, with a specific problem that they feel is not being addressed at the principal level or maybe even at the superintendent level? I mean. Is there no communication allowed between it's, those two entities? It's not that there's a rule, but there's a culture where the teachers don't feel like they would be heard mm -hmm. and like their opinion um, isn't significant to influence the decisions that the board is making. I see. Okay. Uh, did you say earlier that, it, that all curriculum at some level goes to the board for authorization uh, through, through all the grades? Yes, it does. The, the function of a school board is to oversee the functioning of a school district. But when there's no educator and no parent on the school board, there's not a good understanding of how a school should run and how those choices like the curriculum should be implemented. Mm -hmm. For instance, in 2011, just before we moved here, um, and I was researching school districts having taught and worked in Long Beach where I got my credential and grown up in Huntington Beach and knowing those districts really well, 
My husband and I wanted to come back to live close to our parents with our child. And I Googled Los Alamitos Unified School District and found out that in that year, the current board president, the incumbent, wanted to have their say over what a curriculum would be. The advanced placement environmental science class was something that the teachers at the district, I'm sorry, the teachers at the high school wanted to have taught um, as an elective for science. Mm -hmm. an what, year? what year? 2011. Okay. Um, advanced placement is an international curriculum where a student gets high school, and a high school student takes a class, passes a test, and gets college credit so that you don't have to take that basic class when you get to college. Mm -hmm. The curriculum is set. You have to learn what you, the information you need for the test. Mm -hmm. So it's essentially a college level class. It's a college level class at a high school level. Now, the I, Barkey, Jeff Barkey, the current incumbent, mm -hmm. his idea was that he didn't believe in climate change. And so he um, brought this to the school board's attention saying that climate change was going to be, and it was called global warming then, was going to be taught as a hard science, but he would prefer it to be taught as a controversial issue. And the board policy changed based on that, um, that philosophy of that board member to where now every controversial issue class um, needs to be approved to, the, to this day the AP environmental science teacher has to take her curriculum to the board each year, prove to them that the controversial issue of climate change will be taught not as a science, but as a controversial issue. And then they vote that yes, she can teach the class again, and then she has to go to our students and teach that. Um, the problem is, it is considered a controversial issue, but if we're preparing students for a test that's based on the science, they need to learn that science. They need to prepare for the world as it truly is. Well, yeah, particularly if it's a, a college AP class where they're going to be expected to have certain uh, uh, requisite understanding of you know what's happening in the world uh, scientifically. Um, so, what is the state of that Earth Science class today? How is it being taught today? As a equivocating, uh, controversial, um, either or this and that uh, type of uh, approach? Well, teachers are experts in their field. So a teacher, to become a public educator, you have to have a degree in your subject as well as a credential in, in teaching, in education. So teachers will always teach the truth and they will always love each of the, the children and want them to have the basis for a strong education that they need. So it is still true that the board requires the teacher every year to have the class approved. For this particular class. For that particular class. Thus far it's only the controversial issue of um, AP environmental science, which is an elective, but um, it's open to interpretation in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, that and something else could be considered controversial. Mm -hmm. Nonetheless, y again, getting back to this point that there being perhaps a disconnect between the teachers and uh, certainly up the chain of command of the board anyway, um, don't the principals have, uh, can, don't the principals weigh in on this from the various schools and have some sort of say uh, with the board? The principals do have, and everybody technically should have access to the board members and what um, the choices are and the decisions are that are being made. It's sim I'm simply saying that the teachers feel like their academic integrity is not respected and their voice isn't welcome at the table the way they would like it to be. Mm -hmm to make these decisions about what the curriculum will be and about what teacher development will be. They don't, because they're educators, they're the ones who implement the decisions that are made by the school board. The school board needs to have educators on the board to help the board understand in that decision-making process 
what the effects of those decisions will be. Mm -hmm. And right now the teachers don't feel represented and the parents are not represented either. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, big issue coming up, we have to get to it in the few minutes that we have left, and Measure G is coming forward. And I know uh, mo many folks in the, in the community uh, from here to Seal Beach have opinions about that. Uh, what is your opinion? I want to get you on the record at least to be able to say, what is your opinion about this upcoming Measure G that will be on the ballot uh, on November 6th for all uh, voting members of the community to determine whether to self-impose a tax? In this case, a $97 million bond, is that right? By the school district, uh, once again, for modernization. We had a modernization 10 years ago with Measure K, I believe, and um, now again we have an, another modernization uh, bond uh, presented to the voters on November 6th for the Los Alamitos Unified School District. Got an opinion about that one? Um, yes, I do. You know, as a teacher, I have taught in a class where when it rains, we look for the trash cans to put under the drips of water coming from the ceiling. Um, then I have taught in a classroom where in the old portables, it was, you could only plug in so many things, right. which is difficult when you now live in a day and age where the children are bringing their own devices as a school program and there are so many needs for computers in the classroom. Everybody's hooked up. Everybody's hooked up. Um, and I see that the school, the high school is 50 years old and there are repairs that need to be done. Um, but teachers, of course, are looking to this, um, this measure to improve their work facility and their ability to teach the students. Part of it is um, meant to build a new building on the Los Alamitos High School campus facing, um, facing the, the school so that instead of just fences facing the street, there will also be this brand new building there. Um, but of course, taxpayers are concerned with being asked for more money um, to improve the schools. And I think it's really important to look at anything that is asked for to improve the schools and consider whether the needs listed in the ballot measure are valid and whether they will have a true impact on the outcomes for our students because what happens on a campus doesn't just affect the people who have children in the campus, it affects who the citizens are when they come out of the high school and come back into our community as, as adults. So do we have a sense yet of how this money will be spent and where it will be focused on? I get a sense from folks that they're directing it toward the high school now. Yes. Uh, whereas Measure K was more directed toward the other um, uh, K through uh, uh, middle school campuses, um, but have you had a chance to dissect the ballot at all or take a close yes. look at it? Um, so one of the things that they want to add is a new performing arts center at the high school. Right now the one at McGaugh Elementary School is um, better designed and, and larger according to what Mrs. Dr. Kropp said at the State of the District event yesterday morning. They also want to change the gym uh, to make it more accommodating to for all levels of play for males and females because right now as for a high school this size it's a fairly small gym and then of course the building of a new um, a new building to have for science and computer classes. Mm -hmm. You mean uh, did I hear you say that they're are they going to demolish the, the PAC? I think that the Performing Arts Center? It's been stated that they want to have a new one, but that's not the priority. And while it does say in what the in the district statement at this time that there will be a new one, um, it's not set yet what exactly is going to be done because they have to prioritize where the money will be spent. Mm -hmm. One of the things they will do, though, is remove 31 old portables that are being used, some, some as, mostly as classrooms, but some now not even functional for classrooms and are used as storage, so that there will be classrooms, real rooms and real buildings to be able to use. So there are parts of Measure G 
that you would wholeheartedly support and get behind as a teacher. Yes, definitely. Do you have reservations about some parts of it, or are you just pretty much wholeheartedly behind it? No, I think that Measure G is going to be an important, um, important money to be brought into the school for improvements that are necessary. Some of my concerns, though, are for it's one of the major points, and I think it's a good draw for people is the word that it's for security. There are security improvements that are already being made on campuses, um, and Measure G is meant to increase those security measures. Mm -hmm. um, the security measures that are mentioned are all based on physical security, higher fences, stronger fences, um, video cameras, uh, towers like you would find on a college campus for an emergency call, um, and uh, that sort of security. But I think that a high school security and a college, any school campus's security isn't based all in locking intruders out. It's also based in creating citizens starting at kindergarten who have conflict resolution skills, who have social and emotional awareness in how to interact with each other and how to build an inclusive society. If you look at the school shootings, and because of my work with Moms Demand Action, I've been, since this, the shooting of the first graders in Sandy Hook, very involved in learning about the danger of, of guns on campuses. If you look at that, it's mostly people um, who are disenfranchised boys at, at these schools. It's not always something like a stranger just charging the campus and coming on to, um, mm -hmm. to have these sorts of things. And as a teacher who had an escape plan and a lesson plan every day when I looked at my students and I thought about where I would hide them, um, I look at where my daughter goes to school and I wonder how is this kindergartner when it started, how is she going to get over these tall fences? How is the kindergarten teacher going to help these kids escape? It's a very, it's a multifaceted response yeah. to have school safety and I don't think that Measure G includes that sort of response to security. It is all um, based in the strong physical repairs and buildings for the for the school district which are also very important okay um, so there are some gaps in measure G in terms of addressing security you feel I think that the physical aspects of security and what measure G is for is physical buildings and repairs and I think that's very important I think measure G is needed for that but I think it's short-sighted and tunnel-visioned if you think that's the only thing that's going to have an improvement on the security of our campuses. In the last week and a half, I've, I've taken it upon myself to talk to a number of high school kids in anticipation of this, uh, these interviews, these series of interviews, and also some middle school kids as well. And uh, I've come to learn that there is a certain level of anxiety that these kids uh, e evoke and, and say, you know, they themselves don't like the idea of these high fences. And, if, and what you just said about, gee, if there's a shooter or somebody shooting at, in, in my hall, how am I going to get out that fence? How am I going to get out? I'm trapped. I'm, I'm, and there's that sense of anxiety that is palpable among students uh, in the LAUSD right now. So um, what, would, what would some of those other measures be, those mitigating measures that, I mean, do we need more counselors? Do we need more, I mean, how many counselors do we have to address these issues of bullying? Because that's where it starts on the campuses. I mean, do we have an adequate number of counselors and, and psychologists to preempt this kind of behavior? No, we don't. Um, and even when it comes to more of the physical protections, one of the things that our school has done is have a training for the teachers at McGaw, which is um, where my child goes. And it tell they one of the things they were taught about was 
fighting back, physically fighting back with a hard object, with, um, with like physically stopping the shooter and no, learning how to do wound care for, and ha apply tourniquets and gauze. And then those supplies were not supplied to the teachers. Mm -hmm. So it's short-sighted to say, well, I've done this new training for um, to s figure out how to save my students' lives and then learn how to do all of that training, but then not have the equipment given to you, the mag light, which are very expensive. And they're v these very long, very heavy flashlights that can be used as a weapon. Um, for a third grader to wield? No, for the teachers to wield. Oh, for the teachers. But additionally... Um, how do you feel about that, being a teacher yourself? You know, I would rather have a large flashlight than a gun. I don't, I, our current school board member has proposed to the teachers, said to a teacher, wouldn't you like to be armed? And the teacher's answer was, with a hot glue gun? You don't want a real gun. Having a gun in my classroom would have been a recipe for disaster. First of all, kids are kids. They all know where, how to find their hidden birthday presents. Mm -hmm. They would find a gun. And second of all, if I were in the position to stop a killer, a teacher's instinct isn't, I'm going to kill that person. It's, I'm going to protect the people I'm in charge of. And also, I'm going to, teachers aren't trained to be sharpshooters. They're trained to love children and welcome them in. And that's where school security needs to start. Mm -hmm. And that's where smaller class sizes matter. And that's where having school counselors on campus matter. We had more school counselors in the past at the middle schools and fewer students. Now we have more students and they've cut the number of counselors available. How many counselors on a middle school campus? We have two. There are two. Um, two campuses. There's one counselor, if I'm remember, remembering my numbers correctly. For each middle school? Yes. For a population of, for each middle school of about how many? There's, um, I don't, I'm not sure on the numbers. I would have to, to check, but there's one principal and one assistant principal where there used to be two. And then I, I want to be sure on the number, but I believe that it's one counselor per middle school. There's a chance it's two, but it's definitely one less than it used to be. And do they have, are they credentialed, these counselors, in psychological training? For oh, yes. Bullying to be and a, so forth? To yeah. School counselors, yeah. that's what their degrees are in. Yeah. Well, I don't know about, about Oak, but I think McAuliffe is about 1,300 kids, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and I, I'm pretty sure that Oak is about the same number. So the ratio is 1 to 1,300. Is that what you're saying? Honestly, I would have to double check on the number, but it's far too many. I was a teacher who had, the school district numbers now are, the desire for a classroom is the maximum of 34 students. There are classes with 38 on the elementary school campus and at the, um, at the other campuses as well. When I have 38 students in my class, and as a high school teacher, you multiply that by five times, because I see five different groups. Mm -hmm. I don't have the time to make a human connection with every student every day. I barely had the time to make an educational co connection with every student every day. So having that crowding issue is detrimental to the safety as well as the education of our students. So if you were a board member, if you ascended to the position on November 6th of uh, <clears throat> board member for Los Alamos Unified School District, what would be your priorities in terms of turning things around? You obviously see some disconnects in the district. What would be the first couple of things you would move to want to change? I would want there to be more opportunities available to students of all abilities. Right now, with such a focus on the appearance of success based on test scores and trophies, there's an experience of students who are superstars in 
athletics or art or academics having a lot of attention and resources, whereas students who are more typical in their abilities have told me, their parents have told me, we feel like there's nothing our, our kids can do. We went to the ninth grade orientation and we went through the academic part and then the athletic part and we're basically told if you are really good at this, if you've been training since you were three or four years old, we have a place for you here. If not, we have, we have this, we have fewer opportunities for you and you have to find something different. So does that translate for me as the more average students are kind of lost in the shuffle and, and, and I mean, is there, is there a, a dearth, uh, a lack of, let's, what we used to call vocational class training, uh, you know, for, for let's say non-college bound uh, career placement uh, um, students? I believe so. Um, right now there's two things happening academically at this school. One is the district's goal is for all, all kids to take the A through G college requirement to get into the UC schools. The problem with that is that they, biology for instance in 10th grade is the requirement for the A through G classes. There used to always also be a life science class available which is a slower pace for students who aren't prepared to read at the college prep level and keep up with that class. That class has been eliminated. So the 100 students who used to be here in the life science classes are now put into that college prep class, which does say good numbers for the enrollment of people in college prep classes, but also puts in students who feel like they're set up to fail. There's no, they feel like they're set up to fail. Mm -hmm. And as a teacher, I know that when a student comes into a classroom and they don't feel like they can succeed, they become the class cl clown, they become disruptive, they become also, as a teacher, the focus of the teacher because the teacher doesn't want to left, leave any child behind. And I think it's good and well, I think people will easily look at that and say, well, my kid's not suffering because of that because they're taking the biology class anyway and they'll do really well. But that is not true because the typical children and the star children that are in that college prep class, their education is affected by the teacher in these large classes not being able to teach to the giant spectrum yeah. that's available. So Smaller they, classes would work for that. You could have yeah. more focus and attention on each student. Right. We Have we eliminated many of the vocational training classes at the high school? We used to have you know, auto mechanic classes and carpentry classes and things like that uh, through ROP and th that sort of education. Is that a diminished avenue for, let's say, average students um, at the high school looking beyond high school in, in, into um, career placement? Unfortunately, it is. Um, currently, the career technical education is that is available on the campus is about becoming a, a medic um, or working in the hospitality in industry in the management situation. There isn't an opportunity to become proficient at all in, in plumbing or in carpentry or in those sort of auto mechanics, those sort of hands-on skills, mm -hmm. which are both necessary for people who want to have a career in that and can become entrepreneurs and own their own businesses. Yeah. That's and a very technical and lucrative field. It is. It is. My father-in-law is going to retire early with a pension because he's part of the plumbers union. And he, but that's his amazing career in that sort of work. It, and I don't think offering that is saying there are kids who aren't going to be able to go to college. It's saying there are kids who can follow this dream. Everybody's watching these cooking shows and being these amazing chefs. Don't you think they should be able to learn to cook on campus to see if that's an interest that they have? There are no to such classes. To see if they can follow that. Well, homemake is a long gone, oh. <laughs> long okay. gone class, All and right. not on the campus. And it's all well and good to say, oh, but these things are offered off campus. But how is a student supposed to get to something that's off campus and at off hours? Well, you make some very good points, and very eye-opening conversation here for me. 
Uh, but speaking of gone, <laughs> we are going to have to wrap it up because uh, we're, we've only have so much time for each of the candidates. But uh, I certainly appreciate uh, all that you've uh, unpacked for us uh, about uh, students on campus and about that, that disconnect that you see. Uh, give you an opportunity for a last uh, comment or elucidating statement on behalf of your candidacy, if you care? Of course I care. Um, I think that the school board needs to have somebody who represents the voice of the teachers and the parents. And using that voice and that understanding can make fiscally responsible decisions about the educational resources that are available to all of the students in the entire district. Without somebody who knows how to implement the educational ideas that the school board has, without the voice and understanding of an educator behind that, it's difficult for them to be making decisions that are fiscally responsible without knowing if they're educationally responsible. Okay. The teacher knows that. Okay, and you are one. And I am. Okay. All right, we're going to have to stop right there and move on. But Elena Anderson, thank you very much for your insights uh, as a teacher and as a member of uh, Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America. Thank you. Thank you so much for sitting in with us on Backstory. Thank you. And uh, there, of course, will be more to come coming right up.